I think one of the most beautiful experiences in my life, an exciting journey, it's all about moving to a new space. How many love, uh, you know, just moving into a new home, yeah. a new apartment space, fresh carpet, the smell of a clean new house, fresh painted walls, and it's just brand new, unopened appliances. You were the first owner of that appliance. My favorite. <laughs> Packing, not my favorite. Favorite, moving, packing, not so much. And so for me, when I'm um, packing, I don't mind packing the kitchen. I don't mind packing the girls' rooms. I don't mind the cleanup. But one of the things I cannot stand is going into my closet, <laughs> AKA Pastor Sean's closet. And we've accumulated junk and we've accumulated stuff. And for me, I tend to kind of pare down, pare down to my bare essentials. And for Pastor Sean, it's a whole different ball game. I think he's been collecting stuff since the 80s. And at some point, you have to just let it go, all right? <laughs> and for me, I, I don't mind buying a dumpster, getting a dumpster, renting a dumpster. And I'm all about just throwing out the trash, throwing out the excess. Doesn't that feel great? Oh, it feels so great. But then on the back side of that story is Pastor Sean dumpster diving, trying to rescue stuff. And he always comes to me and he says, you know, why are you doing this? I'm like, dude, you gotta cut the ties, man. You can't take that to the next journey. We're not gonna take that to the next house. And so for, for some of you to get you a peek into our closet, we're all a collector of jeans, okay? For me, I have my bare essentials. I have about maybe six pairs. For him, he has like 20, 30. And that's at a minimum, okay? But for some of us, just like life, we tend to collect jeans. And for some of us, we tend to collect jeans that are like boyfriend jeans, you know? For some of you guys, you enjoy maybe the painter's jeans, the comfortable jeans, and just like life, you picked up relationships. Boyfriends, old relationships, old connections, one night stands, mm-hmm. Oh, hashtag real talk today, all right? We're family, so we're gonna dive right in. So just like relationships, these are comfortable, but they're not good for you. They're comfortable, but they won't take you to the next season. And so with just like boyfriend jeans, some of us have gone through certain stages. Maybe you moved into a new neighborhood. Maybe you have a new family experience. And so just like crop jeans, they're trendy. You know, they're here for the moment, then gone the next season. It's not that it's bad. It's just for the moment, the connection, it's temporary. And so it won't take you to the next season but they are a helpful bridge in between seasons. So some relationships are like crop jeans, but some other relationships are just like Pastor Sean's favorites. Oh yeah, you know it, skinny jeans. <laughs> and just like skinny jeans, it's talking about your present life, your career, you streamlined your life, and so you're connecting with people that are helping you in your maybe stepping into a new you know, business adventure. Maybe you're an entrepreneur, maybe you're a restaurateur. And so um, you're you know, handling relationships that are scratch my back and I'll scratch yours kind of relationships. They're temporary, but they're there. They're helpful, streamlined, but they help you in your career. And so you have a tendency for those kinds of genes, but I know some of us have found old faithful. Oh yeah. Boot cut. <laughs> this is a timeless piece, just like our relationships. They have gone with us through time. And every season, it just looks good. And with time, it just gets better and better. They kind of weathered through stuff with you. They look good in photos. They kind of hug you in all the right places. <laughs> and so for some of us, we've, it's a tried and true pair. And many are, of our relationships we have tested some. They have been with us through the long haul. And they have been faithful to us. And today we're going to talk about relationships. Hashtag safe people. Who are those safe people in your life? 
Are you a safe person? Can people's stories be trusted in your hands? And so as we are diving into this, I want you to look into Romans chapter 12, and we're going to dive into the scriptures of what Jesus talks about safe people. So brothers and sisters, it says, do not be shaped by this world. Instead, be changed within by a new way of thinking. And your love, it must be real. I want you to hate what's evil, but hold on to what is good. Love each other like brothers and sisters. Give each other more honor than you want for yourselves. And wish good for those who harm you. Wish them well. And don't curse them. If someone does wrong to you, don't pay him back by doing wrong to him. Try to do what everyone thinks is right. And do your best to live in peace with everyone. You see, my friends, don't try to punish others when they wrong you, but Wait for God to punish them with his anger, because it's written, I will punish those who do wrong. I will repay them, says the Lord. In other words, at the end of time, when our days come to an end, all of us will meet Jesus face to face, and we will have to account for all the words, all the relationships, the connections, and what we've done with his name. Let's continue. But you should do this, and this should be our reaction. He's in charge of revenge. He's in charge of anger. For us, this is our responsibility. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. And doing this will be like pouring burning coals on his or her head. You see this? This illustration is all about our enemies, our relationships, our connections. How do we deal with our connections? Especially in our small group season, last week we talked about storytellers. This week we're diving into safe people. I think most of us don't have an understanding that we have a choice. We have a choice to share our space, space with other people that we feel safe with, that are sent from God that will add value to our lives and that will help us move us into our next space in place in Jesus. And most of us feel like we're held hostage by our old connections, that we have no choice, that because they were there when we were younger that all of a sudden because of their negativity that you have to carry them on into your future. But let me show you, friends, what the scripture says about connections. I want you to start looking at Jesus' life in, as we explain connections. You see, in his world, he had a crowd. People loved his message. People loved what he was all about. Oh, they came by the droves. In the thousands upon thousands, these were his actual fans. They admired him from afar, but when it came to commitment, they just couldn't go there. And then from the thousands, they, he would draw the hundreds. And the hundreds, they would follow him, listen to him. And as soon as they heard the word, they would go back to their towns and begin to share the word with others. And then from the hundreds, he drew the 12. The 12 were his intimate guy pals, the ones, his road dogs, the ones that he could count on. And these were a bunch of misfits that that loved Jesus, that would go and do anything for him. And he approached them one by one and said, I want you to leave everything and then follow me. And that they did. And from the 12, you have the three. His intimate circle, the circle of trust. And it would be jo James, the elder. He was the older brother of Jesus. And there would be John, the youngest of the disciples. And he loved Jesus so much that you would see him in actual paintings and pictures. In some of the mosaics, John would lean across on, on Jesus' shoulder. And they would capture him because in that position, he was like, this is my brother. This is whom I love. And there would be Peter. Peter, he was raw, edgy, rough around the edges, cursed like a sailor. He was the fisherman in the group. And so for him, he was the ride and die. I will do anything for you, Jesus, to the point where he cut off someone's ear and Jesus had to restore the ear to the soldier. You see, Peter, his name, Rock, 
And Jesus would say, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So these were, these were his guys, his crew. We have his fans. You have the hundreds that were committed and then the intimate 12 and then the three. But little did you know that Jesus had enemies too. And in the letter to the Romans, it would display this picture of, of people and hospitality. And little did you know that in the upper room, the last supper before he was actually crucified, Jesus had a meal with his friends. And right next to him, sharing and eating from the same plate, sharing the same cup, Judas, who would betray him, would drink from the same cup of Jesus. And eye to eye, shoulder to shoulder, conversations, face to face, no qualms about Judas. But there, Jesus would lean in and say, whatever you have in your heart to do, go ahead and do it. And there the scripture records that the devil entered Judas and he left the party. Hospitality. Why, why give something to eat to your enemies? Why give something to drink to those who have harmed you and hurt you? In Middle Eastern cultures, this would be a symbol of openness. If I invite you to the table, it would be a simple a symbol of openness that you're welcome into my house. And Jesus is saying in the same breath, I want you to do this I, as I have done to my enemies. Amen. Why? And the same token, he would say it would be like burning hot coals on someone's head. I know many of you pride yourselves in being a grill master, but um, you have not met Diana Nepstad. And I distinctly remember, like, for in our house, um, I bought a grill for Pastor Sean for Father's Day as a gift. He was really excited. Beautiful grill. I might say so. And um, because I was the one who gave it. And anyhow, side point. Anyways, let's continue. Um, Pastor Sean, I would ask him, you know, go grill some steaks. Go grill some chicken. He would be really excited. Go back there, start grilling, and I would receive a massacred piece of meat. He was a little intimidated because he didn't want to get poisoned, like food poisoning with salmonella and all of that. And so I told him, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll take over from here. <laughs> I had a good friend, a guy friend that came over and he showed me how to start a coal fire. And so what you would do, and this would be kind of like the shortcut way because there's all kinds of gadgets now. You would pour the coal in. You would um, put kindling and newspaper, maybe um, smoking chips as you soak them in the water. You would combine all of them in there and you would light the fire. The fire would catch on to the coals and you would wait for the coals to turn this ashen white. And that would be a signal for you to go ahead and release the filter and the coals would be centered into the grill. And so as it's centered into the grill, the dynamics or the science behind it is the, the mass of quantity, it would intensify the heat. So it was centered in the middle. That's the most intense heat. The outskirts would be the cooler areas. Jesus is saying this. Like kindness, it's like burning hot coals on someone's head. The closer you get to the heat the person becomes undone. They expected you to repay the favor. They expected you to hurt them like the way you hurt them. But if you show them hospitality, they would actually become undone, uncomfortable. It's almost like eating humble pie. In some of these areas that Jesus is speaking to us about, he wants, to, wants us to know particular things. I don't want you to write these down, but I do want you to take note in, inside your mind right now because you're going to start ruminating on some of these things. Reality check, people skills, and managing relationships. Don't write these down, but just begin to think. He asked us, there's a reality check. I want to know if you can be trusted with my message. I want to know if you can be trusted with my love, with my compassion, because you've interacted with the life change that has happened to you. 
but can you really be trusted with my message as you carry it out to the marketplace, to the baseball fields with your children, in the locker room as you share conversations with your friends, on the construction site at Trader Joe's, whether you're at Google or Tesla, wherever the spectrum of life you're in right now, where you're at right now, can you be trusted with the message of Jesus? Can you show it, live it, demonstrate it? How about people skills? None of us have people skills. We haven't learned people skills when we were in elementary school, in middle school, or high school. No one taught us, but by just programming, going through life, by you know, actually you know, failing and learning, you begin to adopt certain skills. And those skills in life haven't helped you up to this point. Instead, you have carried those toxic relationships into your world. And so what you've gathered, you've actually accumulated, and now it's not taking you into your destiny. And for some of us, it could be managing relationships. Managing relationships. When we look at relationships that we're involved in, we're not sure how to place them, how to organize them, especially for some of us who have come to faith in Jesus. This is our first time. Our first time, our first connections, and what we were, we're no longer connecting to those same relationships. We're not laughing at the same jokes. We don't even shop for the same clothes like we used to. We're not going to Starbucks and having the same conversations. I don't, I don't hang out with you guys anymore because we're just not connecting. And so I want you to write this down, that Jesus does this naturally. When you encounter him, write this down. There is a healthy space that's created. A healthy space that's created. You need to understand that in your journey, when you come to faith in Jesus, it's not like you don't like people anymore. It's just you're not connecting on the same level anymore. And so this margin happens, and then all of us become uncomfortable because we're like, okay, I, what then? What do I do? And now I, I don't know who to hang out with because I'm so in love with Jesus. I can't laugh at the same jokes anymore. I just, it's tiresome to keep talking about the same person. And I don't want to go to the same club. And I don't want to connect with people that way. I, I don't smoke my days away. And so how do I connect with people? Healthy space. It's a margin. And it's okay. Don't be afraid of it. And secondly, I want you to write down healthy connections. You see, you don't know how to have those healthy connections yet, but Jesus is going to teach you. He's going to teach you how to relate to women differently, how to relate to men differently, how to actually be nice to people because you were, you were actually rude before you met Jesus. Um, as for some of you, you used, to, you used to blow your top off at the baseball field, at the football field, at your kids' games. Yeah, you were that person. You were actually wrestling. You know, you thought, you know, the kids were thinking that you were hugging the coach, but actually you were handling the coach. <laughs> Healthy connections. Don't be afraid of it. God is sending them your way. And thirdly, I want you to write down... You need to choose friends, positive connections, healthy connections, godly connections that are moving in the same direction. We're all in the same room, all of us, myself included. I'm on this journey with you. And so as we're moving in this journey, we're aiming towards Jesus. Some of us are running a little slower. Some of us are midway. Some of us are running faster, but it's okay. And for me, if I could share a little bit of my story at the age of 23, from 18 to 23, I've given my life at university. I was on the road to having a career to be a classical artist. I was a classically trained singer. I wanted to sing on the notable operatic stages around the world. That was my goal, my aim. I philosophically thought differently. I looked different. I acted differently. I would hang out at all the coffee shops with all of my artist friends and philosophize about life and what I thought about politics and what I thought about, you know, actually being single and I would smoke and drink my days away and then some, experimented on all levels. I had that kind of life and when I encountered Jesus at 23, when I hit rock bottom of my life, my life drastically changed. I wasn't connecting to my friends like I used to. I didn't look the same. I didn't speak the same. All of a sudden, I was radically transformed by God himself. His love overwhelmed my life. But there, let me say this, but for some of you, you're on that same path. 
Right now, there's a radical change that is happening to you. And you're like, I don't even where to be, know where to begin. And let me help you weather through and navigate and save you a lot of harm, save you a lot of time, save you a lot of broken hearts and energy and investing the wrong kind of energy in the people that you shouldn't be connecting with. Let's write this down. We need to learn about unsafe friends, unsafe friends. There's safe people and there's unsafe people. And most of us, we, we are hungry for connection. And so let me, let me show you what the scripture says. I have nothing to say. Me, I have nothing to say, but God has a lot to say. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26, it says this. Good people, they take advice from their friends, but an evil person is easily led to do the wrong thing. It's not in their makeup. Wise people, if you're around them, you listen to their advice, you will be with wise people and make wise decisions. But for those of us who are bent on, on having our own opinion, we will go and follow our own wisdom, our own smarts about life, about relationships, and you will see them fail and fail and fall and fall and connect with the toxic same people. Childhood friends. Some of us have small ones at home, but maybe for some of you, you've been walking with your childhood friends all through adulting. And let me see this. Let's, let's watch this together. Proverbs 28, 7, it says this. Children who obey what they have been taught, they're wise. Parents, speak up. Show them. Show your kids who to connect with. They, you have wisdom. You've learned. You had a longer life, so show them. Let them know. You know what? There's something up with that. But watch this. It says the second part. But friends of troublemakers disgrace their parents. And we know them. We could spot the Bart Simpsons, right? <laughs> we could spot the Sharpays of high school musical in every environment. It's like, sis, I don't know about that girl. She, she messy. What do you mean by messy, mom? No, she's into mess. <laughs> How about the Eddie Haskells of Leave it to Beaver? Oh, you know, they smile on the front, but you know there's a whole hot mess behind that, right? Wow. Childhood friends, flattering friends. Oh, we met them. There's some in some of our circles right now. I'm sure of it. Flattering friends. Proverbs 27, 6, it says this. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. You see, wounds, like if you go through a challenge in your relationship, the relationship is actually redeemable because you can take it. Your friends like that, their wisdom, it's valuable. They save you pain. Oh, but someone, someone who is not your friend, they don't have your best interest in mind. They will pacify you. Oh, that looks great. Those poor people on American Idol. Who told them? It's like, you're wrong. Who are your friends? You need to break up with them. They're enablers. They're not good for you. They tell you things that are not helpful to you. Flattering friends. How about gossip friends? You've heard of gossip girl? Gossip guys? Oh, it's not just one on one side, one sex. Oh, they have them on both sides, female and male. Proverbs 16, 28, it says this, a useless person causes trouble and a gossip ruins friendships. Yeah, it's the person who's always in the mix, always in the know, likes to drop little tidbits of information in the middle of relationships and likes to stir up stuff. It's that kind of friend, but we could take the same scripture in another translation and it gives a different tone. Write this down, troublemaker friends. Troublemaker friends. Proverbs 16, 28 in the New Living Translation, it actually says this. A troublemaker plants seeds, seeds of strife and gossip separates the best of friends. A troublemaker, it's someone, all of us, all of us have, we have seeds. Seeds of good and seeds that are terrible. And we plant them in certain relationships, inappropriate talk. We say too much. We say things against another friend. And then we like to step away like a good novella. Oh, Maria Mercedes, ooh, got nothing on you. Queen of the South, ooh, got nothing on you. 
But in every toxic culture of an office atmosphere, remove that person, and there's peace. Right? You've met that person in high school, either in the schoolyard and in elementary school. You just know someone who's like rushing into trouble. Troublemaker friends. How about this? Attitude friends. Woo! Can't wait to tell you about this one. Attitude, friends. Proverbs 22, verses 24 through 25. It says, don't make friends with quick-tempered people or spend time with those who have bad tempers. If you do, you will be like them, and then you will be in real danger. It's the one who shows up with shades on, comes into an atmosphere, and you're not sure with, whether it's Dr. Jekyll or Miss, Mr. Hyde. You have no clue and you're walking around eggshells and it feels like you have to do double dutch because you're like, is it a good day or is it a bad day? I'm not quite sure. I have no clue. So you're like just walking gently around this personality type. And you know some of you women what I'm talking about. As soon as you recognize an atmosphere, you could recognize where that atmosphere is emanating from. As soon as you share the same space, this look comes upon them. attitude. Call it. Just call it. Toxic. Toxic. How about healthy friends? Healthy friends. I love listening to your pens and pencils. I love it. Proverbs 1130, it says this, the seed of good deeds become a tree of life and a wise person wins friends. You see, the person who is wise the person who is a healthy person is actually a person who has wisdom on their life and it's attractional. People love being around them. Things that they say at the right time, it's just helpful. And they have a winsome attitude. They're life-giving. They smile. They know how to weather through things. They know how to help. And it's the person that you would love to pick for your team when you're on a project in some kind of shared experience, maybe at an office. But it's those kinds of friends that you need to aim for. And so there are some warnings about friends too. I want you to write this down, warnings. There's some warnings. And so what does that look like? What do unhealthy people look like? Unsafe people look like? Proverbs 13, 20, it says this. Become wise by walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and watch your life fall to pieces. We need to aim to be around those who have a, a life of wisdom. A life that is just covers with, with advice that it sounds like it's coming from God. That their life is anchored in Jesus because all of us want healthy connections. There are men and women in this room that want a healthy marriage that want to have a healthy way of parenting because we saw a bad model at home. Hello. Some of us grew up in dysfunction, and so we want a healthy way of living life, treating people, speaking to people. And so my question to you, who are you hanging with that will actually add to your life so you can go into your future actually living God's purposes through your life? We're going to have many words with friends. And so this first thing I want you to write down is friends who don't know God. You see, some of us, we don't know how to relate to people that don't know God. Some of us that have come and encountered Jesus, now we've disconnected because there's this space, this healthy space that no, no longer they're influencing us in our internal worlds. So what do we do then? How do we relate to them? How do we relate to people that don't know Jesus? Do we just leave planet Earth? No, no. This is God's approach. I want you to see this. Colossians chapter four says this. Be wise in the way you act with people who are not believers, making the most of every opportunity. It says when you talk, you should always be kind and pleasant so you will be able to answer everyone in the way you should. And so when we're relating to people that don't know Jesus, don't be rude. Don't yell at the nail attendant who's actually do your, doing your nails at the nail salon. 
don't not leave a, a tip when you're at Chili's. People are always watching you, your behavior. It communicates a lot more of what you believe and who you are and your core values. Because it gives us an opportunity to influence the people and the places that you used to um, be influenced by, now you could turn the tables and Jesus is saying, now I want you to be an influencer. The next thing I want you to write down is, how about the friends who hurt me? How about the friends who hurt me? Abused me, rejected me, harmed me, drug my name through the mud. What about those friends? How am I supposed to relate to them? Matthew chapter 5, it says this. You're familiar with this old written law? Love your friend and its unwritten companion. Hate your enemy. He says, I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. And when someone gives you a hard time, respond with energies of prayer like the 21 days of prayer. I would love to see you here. It says here, for then you are working out of your true selves, meaning you're God's kids and your God created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm, the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless of the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. It says, if all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who are greeting you, do you expect a medal, a round of applause? Any run-of-the-mill average Joe does that. In a word, what I'm saying is this. God is saying, I want you to grow up in your love. Your kingdom subjects now. You actually communicate the values of the kingdom. And he says, act like it. You're my sons. You're my daughters. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others and the way God lives towards you. In other words, we received God's gracious benefits of being his kids. And now it's time to pay it forward. You see, when I was a young girl, by the age of three, I had my first sexual experience because I was abused by three men in my world. From age three all the way up to age 12, I was molested, targeted, specifically by these men. And so the majority of my childhood, I can't remember. I have some glimpses, and even as I was growing up, I even had flashbacks. And for some of us, this is a real test of who we are in Jesus. Because these scriptures, like you, I read them for the first time, and I was struggling. I didn't know how to relate to men nor to women. I didn't know what to do. And so I struggled with my pain, my anxiety, and there were other things that came out of that experience. And so by the age of 23, when I came to know Jesus, these things rocked my world. And so I didn't know how to, how to walk through life with this pain. And when Jesus healed me, and when Jesus started to change my thinking, I began to share the space with some of these people. I confronted my, my abusers. Some of them told me straight to my face, you've ruined my life, thinking that I was going to keep their secret. But at that moment when I faced them, I said, I forgive you. Hardest thing I've ever done. All of them passed on. They're not here on planet Earth anymore. They're actually in the face of the creator. And just because I shared the same space, it doesn't mean, and, and because I forgave them, it doesn't mean that I have trust with them again. It doesn't mean that they babysit my kids. But it does mean that I'm free. But this is the nuts and bolts to your stories. Many of you are finding challenge in some of your relationships because it's touching on some of these areas in your life. And I'm here to tell you it takes practice. It takes time. But don't get discouraged. Don't give up. 
Every day is a choice. And for me, when I, I told the Lord, I told him this, I said, if you forgave them before they took their last breath and you received them into your kingdom, it's, it's all right with me, Jesus. It's all right with me. Just help me to forget. Wipe away every tear because I know you're the ultimate savior. You're my daddy God. A real journey for some of us. It's not something light. For some of you men and women, this hits on certain chords, but God in his loving kindness, he will walk with you in some of those spaces in your life. I promise you. He's faithful to you. I want you to write this down. When it talks about us being safe people, I want you to write down, be a friend who refreshes others. Be a friend who refreshes others. Proverbs 25, it says this, reliable friends who do what they say are like cool drinks of, of water in sweltering heat, so hot, especially in the 103 and 105 degree weather in Antioch, California. <laughs> it's refreshing. And this next scripture, Proverbs 25, 11 through 12, it says the right word at the right time is like a custom made piece of jewelry. And a wise friend's timely reprimand, it's like a gold ring slipped right onto your finger. In other words, there was something out of place and your friend came and, and was so kind to say the right thing at the right time. And it pulled the whole outfit together, in other words. It just pulled your life together. Be that kind of friend. And lastly, Choose to be a safe person. Choose to be a safe person. This is my encouragement to you for all of you. I want you to read these scriptures because it's Jesus' words. John 15, it says, I told you these things for purpose, that my joy might be complete in you and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, that you love one another the way I have loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for others. You are my friends. And when you do the things that I command you, I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking, saying, writing up the blueprints. But no, he says, I've, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. And this last scripture, it says this, and this is Jesus. It says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are mine. My disciples, my kids, my son, my daughter. And as we're looking at managing relationships, are we safe people or unsafe people? At some point, friends, we're gonna to have to live what the Bible teaches. You're gonna to have to actually read the Bible and actually do what the Bible says. And it doesn't happen overnight. Some of these skills take practice. Every day going to Jesus, every day managing relationships. And for some of us, we have all of these relationships and we think that they go in the same box when we start doing life. But really, what God is saying to all of us is this. I want to deal with your past. You see, some of your connections from your past, you actually have to deal with them. Because if you don't deal with them, they might tamper with your present. Some of your connections in the present are polluted because you keep bringing things from the past. If you don't deal with the past, you can't really have a future. Some of us have kept connections that are not good for us. And so we bring it into our present and we never engage with our future. They actually prevent us from the next step. 
And so we keep reinventing the wheel of connection. We keep practicing the same practices. And we keep living in the past. But what Jesus wants, he wants us to do is this. Deal with our past so we can actually have a healthy present. So we can actually live into the future. But you have to decide who you want to bring in the journey. Because your future depends on it. If you wouldn't mind just bringing your eyes to this focal point, we have to deal with the toxic relationships in your world. Some of you right now, Jesus is talking to you about the toxic connections that are in your world. It's time to deal with them. Once and for all, there are names popping up right now. Names, old boyfriends, the girl that keeps calling Friday night, wears that dress, it's a trigger for you. Maybe the tone that she has with you. Maybe for some of us, it's the rage. Maybe you shouldn't go to your kids' baseball games and football games. Maybe that's a trigger for you. Maybe for some of us, it's avoiding the locker room. For some of us, disconnecting. You could still be gracious. You could still be kind, but you can't connect like you used to. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes. Some of us, and I see it right now, I see an imagery that we used to connect with friends that you would smoke the same way, talk the same way, Maybe it's substance abuse or alcoholism, whatever it is. God is saying it's time to disconnect with that toxic relationship. They're not helping you in your future. For some of you, it's that, maybe it's that promotion. Maybe it's that toxic culture in your office. For some of us, it's maybe we need to pack our stuff and move out finally. Jesus, I pray right now that you give the people the empowerment to move on to the next step. Teach them and show them once and for all how to disconnect so they could go on to their future in Jesus' name.